Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Northern Kentucky Spotlight Podcast presented by CBG. I'm your host, Sarah Brookbank. Today on the podcast, we are joined by Nancy Brunson, Communications and Content Manager for the Louisville Orchestra. She highlights their upcoming In Harmony Tour performance on July 11th at Megacorp Pavilion in Newport. On NKY at Work, Nancy Spidey is joined by Rob Hudson of Frost Brown Todd. They talk about the Supreme Court's recent decisions on affirmative action in religious accommodation and how those will impact employers. Thank you to our podcast sponsors, CVG, our title sponsor, C Crew Consulting, our digital sponsor, and our episode sponsor, Haran. We have an exciting event coming up at the Chamber for alumni of our leadership programs. Our latest Leadership Alumni Summer Series is happening on Wednesday, July 19th. This installment will focus on developing a culture of well-being, including what a culture of well-being is and how well-being support helps attract and retain talent. Alumni of all leadership programs at the NKY Chamber are welcome to attend this series. You can register now at nkychamber.com slash events. Now, let's go meet our members of the week, hear from our sponsors, and Nancy and I will be back with your guests. CBG Airport is the lowest fare airport in the tri-state region with 54 nonstop flights and direct international service to seven destinations, including Paris, France, and now home to both DHLs and Amazon's global cargo hubs. The airport is furthering its position as leader in aviation and is deeply committed to being an economic driver for the community. You can learn more and start your next adventure at CBGAirport.com. Ranking on Google Search and Maps is easy to understand, but hard to do. It requires constant effort and attention, uploading new photos, responding to Google reviews, writing weekly posts, and checking suggested updates. Google listing optimization takes experience and time, and there are no shortcuts. C-Crew gives your Google My Business account the steady, consistent attention it needs to be effective, optimizing, updating, and expanding critical content every single week. From local retail stores to large regional networks, C-Crew generates content, establishes benchmarks, and creates dramatic measurable increases in engagement. So what can C-Crew do for your business? More calls, more clicks, more clients. Congratulations to our members of the week. You can learn more about these businesses by following the Northern Kentucky Chamber on social media where we will highlight one of these businesses each day. Now, let's meet our members of the week. The Louisville Orchestra has long been recognized for its innovation and as the cornerstone of the Louisville performing arts community. Infinity of Northern Kentucky is a premier automotive dealer that truly values each and every guest who chooses to shop with them. Reflex Recruiting Flexibility builds custom recruiting solutions to help find the best talent in today's dynamic business environment. Beckman Coulter Diagnostics has challenged convention to elevate the diagnostic laboratory's role in improving patient health for more than 80 years. Pass Cable Group the ball, and they will enhance your staffing game. Lively Financial is dedicated to helping their clients achieve financial goals with integrity and transparency by prioritizing their best interests above all else. Hi, everyone. Today on the podcast, we are joined by Nancy Brunson, who is the Communications and Content Manager of the Louisville Orchestra. Nancy, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you so much. So great to be here. So exciting. And the Louisville Orchestra, you guys are like our newest chamber member. You guys are a very exciting new member. Uh, You guys have an event coming up here in Northern Kentucky. We'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, tell us your story. Tell us about the Louisville Orchestra. We know the Louisville Orchestra, we like to refer to it as kind of the DNA of the Louisville Orchestra, started in 1937 with the Great Flood of Louisville. And at the time, there was civic leaders and business leaders, and the, the city was decimated, who started thinking about how could the city be rallied, how could they heal the city, how could they enrich the city, and so they came up with the idea of having an orchestra, believe it or not, which was then called the Louisville Philharmonic. Um, They hired a conductor from Chicago, brought him in, and immediately the orchestra became something that the community rallied behind, And it also became a very innovative orchestra. As a young orchestra, the Louisville Orchestra kind of rejected what would be called the European programming 
example. So instead of just concentrating on all of what we like to call the classical music business war horses, there was more balancing of programming going on. And the orchestra also started its own record label with help from the Rockefeller Foundation, only orchestra in the world to have its own record label. And they started commissioning composers like Aaron Copeland to write pieces of music specifically for the Louisville Orchestra to record on first edition records. That was something that was completely and totally unheard of. And the orchestra really caught fire and became a very integral part of the community. At the time, they had two different venues. So how they balanced the programming was, they would have the quote unquote war horses in one venue, and then they would have the new music in another venue. And what they saw eventually was that they were actually getting more people at the new music concerts than at the music that was like traditional classical music, because all of this music was inspired by the city of Louisville and by its orchestra. So now we flash forward to 2014, where the Louisville Orchestra actually hired, I believe Teddy is the youngest conductor to become the music director and conductor of a major orchestra in the history of the United States. He was 24 years old at the time, was the assistant conductor of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, was a protege of Michael Tilson Thomas, who's quite uh, an esteemed conductor in the United States and around the world. And Teddy then became the music director of the orchestra. And it was what we like to call the perfect DNA fit because Teddy's whole thought process was a 21st century orchestra has to be a part of the community. It has to be community oriented. It has to be innovative. And so here we are with, like you mentioned, the In Harmony Commonwealth Tour of the State of Kentucky, which is the first time an orchestra uh, in the United States has toured its own state with money from a state legislature. That's never been done before. That is very cool. Yes. So the big thing that we are here to talk about is this In Harmony Commonwealth Tour that you guys are about to embark on. Tell us a little bit about this, what it means for the state, and uh, when you guys will be up here in Northern Kentucky. Well, you know, the, the tour actually uh, began in May of this year. We were in Eastern Kentucky, in Pikeville, Prestonsburg, and Harlem. Um, and the idea was to bring orchestra musicians to dozens of communities across the Commonwealth of Kentucky and perform works that would appeal to all audiences, including those war horses type things, but also bring in some new music. And I know we're going to talk about our creator's core, but um, we have three composers in residence at the local orchestra, which is also something that's unheard of. Usually an orchestra will have one, and they're there for a few weeks, maybe a couple of months, or they're there on for a year, sort of as a residency, they go in and out. These three people live here in Louisville, they are a member of our staff, but at any rate, they have written music for these tour legs. So the idea is to reflect the history of Kentucky, its rich heritage of music, and go into communities and engage their community organizations, their educational organizations, schools, libraries, chambers, etc. Having musicians go and interact and sort of share the experience of the universal language of music with these areas that we're going into. And we also, during these tour legs, feature local musicians. So like for instance, in Ashland, no, yes, no, I'm sorry. Is it Ashland? Yes, it's Ashland. One of the presidents of the college there is an opera singer. He's gonna be doing a full recital before our actual performance. Very cool. When we were in Eastern Kentucky, one of the pieces of music that was written by one of our creator for um, used a very well-known hazard musician, she's a singer-songwriter, and an opera singer who had settled in Hazard from New York and come back home, and then three bluegrass musicians playing with the orchestra. So the idea is to really bridge this gap between rural and urban to not just have an exciting performance tour of an orchestra like the Dallas Symphony goes to France, 
but to have a tour, an initiative that allows the elder musicians and, and the staff to meet people where they are and explore the arts in their region and their area through musical and educational collaborations and everyone wins. Yeah, that is so cool, especially, like you said, Kentucky has such a rich musical history. Oh, a lot of people don't really think about it as often as they probably should. Um, I know that that is a really big part of our heritage here. It's part of the state. Um, and then with this tour, you guys are coming to Newport on July 11th. So yes. that is just, it's right now, basically. So tell us about this uh, iteration of the tour. Well, I'm really excited, and I'm also really excited that we're a member of the North, of Northern Kentucky Chamber, the Inquiet Chamber, because I actually did my graduate work at CCM. So I was in the Cincinnati area for three years and, you know, over in Kentucky quite a few times. And so we are going to be performing at the Megacorp Pavilion on July 11th, as you said, at 7.30. But during the day... We will also be sending our community engagement department and education department out to libraries um, in and around the Northern Kentucky area and different locations with small ensembles of musicians who will be putting on programs, educational programs. Specifically, what we're really taking out with this leg of the tour is our Once Upon an Orchestra program, which was conceived with the Louisville Public Library System. And again, those creative core people that we haven't talked extensively about yet, composed music around popular children's books. So it's really for all ages. I actually worked at one because they needed to have somebody fill in and I used to be an education manager at another orchestra. And it was just extraordinary because there were probably 300 people there with their kids, some of them babies, and then just people showing up. But we show the interaction between literature and music, and then the kids get to have what we like to call sort of a petting zoo with the orchestra uh, instruments that are there. They can actually hold a trumpet. They can draw a bow across a violin and talk to musicians. So that'll be going on during the day. All of that's posted on our website at louisvilleorchestra.org slash inharmonytour. And then at 7.30 at night, we're going to have this wonderful, wonderful concert. The guest artist for this concert is actually our conductor, Teddy Abrams, who is quite well known as a clarinetist and a composer and also a pianist. So what's very exciting about this concert is that Teddy is going to be playing Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue and conducting from the piano in all of these concerts. So I, I'm sure a lot of your listeners know the Rhapsody in Blue. And of course, you can bet Teddy's going to get a lot of, out of that clarinet solo that starts the whole thing since he's a clarinetist. He's going to be leaning hard on, let's just make that the best lasando we've ever heard. And then we also have some of those war horses on there. The Overture to Candide by Leonard Bernstein, which is, is opening the concert, which is just so much fun. Um, the Overture to Rossini's William Tell, which is where the Lone Ranger theme comes from, High Ho Silver. And then we have two of our creators' cores, one a world premiere. Tyler Taylor has written something called In Memory Safe where another of the creators core who doesn't have a piece on, the, on this particular leg of the tour, she did on the Eastern Kentucky one, is gonna be singing because she's also a very well-known singer. And then we have the other one doing a piece called Megalopolis, which we have done with our Making Music series here in Louisville, which is just a really, really fun piece about the sounds in a city and and the instruments and the orchestra imitating that. It's just, it's really, really great. And then there's a Rhapsody in Blue. And then also um, we have a couple of encores that people won't want to miss. One of them by John Williams, if that gives anybody uh, kind of a, a, a hint. And because it is the month of July, we really can't leave off Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture. We're going to be playing the finale where the cannons and the fireworks and the bells and everything all happen. So it's gotta be everybody's favorite. <laughs> you cannot miss the cannon sounds. I promise yeah, that, really that is such really an exciting is. experience to feel that in concert. There you go. 
But yeah, so anyway, it's going to be a lot of fun, a great variety of music, kind of something for everyone. And that's the other thing about the In Harmony. We're trying to program these tour concerts to sort of give everybody something to really enjoy and latch on to. And I will say what was interesting to me in the Eastern Kentucky tour the piece that really sent people through the roof. And we were doing some completely different pieces than what we're doing now, but, but some really familiar pieces. Was that piece that Lisa Villalava put together called Home that involved all those Kentucky musicians with the orchestra. People just, I mean, they were crying, they were on their feet. It was, it was really cool. Yeah, that sounds, yeah, sounds so exciting. I love that you guys are touring the entire state. We're so excited to have you up in Northern Kentucky. And you have mentioned, excuse me, you have mentioned this a couple of times during this interview is this creative core. So tell us about this. Tell us about this program. It's really neat. Incredible, incredibly innovative. This was all Teddy's idea because he really believes I think because he's a composer himself and a really well-known one, actually. Um, he just had an album that came out on Georgia Gramophone, which is which is the leading classical label um, for classical music. He really wanted to be able to support young composers because, you know, when you think about the history of classical music, Mozart, Beethoven, they all have patrons, right? Nowadays... There aren't that many patrons in classical music. Yes, there are philanthropists who do do that, but then where do they actually perform? In the days of Mozart and Beethoven, these orchestras, a lot of times, you know, they, they were owned by the patrons. So there was a natural performance outlet for the piece when, once it was written. And Teddy really saw that there was a gap here going on. So what he thought was this was really conceived as a successor project to first edition records. As I told you before, these were new pieces that were recorded on and, and people bought these records like you would any other record. The Creator's Core is sort of a giant leap forward of that concept. So we have auditions basically for the creators. I think this year we had 400 composers come and compete and they chose three for the next season and three for our following season of 24-25 and they act as artist leaders so their whole reason for being in Louisville with free a, a free house to live in with a salary with health insurance is so that they can develop meaningful relationships with the people in their neighborhood, which is Shelby Park in Louisville, and also the whole city of Louisville by going out and doing educational. They, they have a whole conducting program, a whole composition program in the school system in Louisville. And they really embody Teddy's vision and the orchestra's vision and conviction that music is a fundamental part of civic life and culture. And so these three people come in and they write pieces of music for the people of Louisville. And so what we're doing next year and in our next season, which is really kind of fun, and you, you know, I would encourage your listeners to actually look at our season because we're not that far away. We're only like an hour and a half. And there's some interesting things going on, but we're ending the season with a festival of music written by the three creators that have been chosen for 23-24. And that way, you'll be able to really see them side by side and their different inspirations and their different styles. So this program gives these people actually a place for their music to be performed. During the season, we'll also be performing some things that were written pre-existing um, that the orchestra, and then we also have during the season what's called a reading. And Teddy brings the orchestra together with each one of the creators and the creators they just read music, they cite read music that the creators have written before. So that perhaps if some of these pieces have never been performed by a full symphony orchestra, they actually get to hear their work being performed. And who knows, maybe going, oh, that didn't really work with the full orchestra. Maybe I need to go back in and tweak that. But that's really the, the point of the creators is to give them an opportunity to really compose and get their, have their music have exposure 
with a leading symphony orchestra. Nancy, thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. I know I am looking forward to this concert on the 11th, and I hope more of our listeners can join us as well. But Nancy, thank you again for joining us today. All right, Sarah. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Nancy Spivey, Vice President of Talent Strategies for the Northern Kentucky Chamber of Commerce. And uh, today on our NKY at Work podcast, I am with Rob Hudson. And Rob is a familiar face to many of us in the uh, HR community. He is an employment lawyer extraordinaire uh, with Frost Brown Todd. Um, so we're talking today about the Supreme Court and all that is going on right now. It seems like it's natural this time of year to start seeing all of these rulings and things going on. And I know you have two cases you wanted to kind of bring up to us today. So uh, Yeah, thank you for having me. Of here. course. I, it's never a dull moment with labor and employment law. Literally multiple times a month, we'll see changes. And last week, the United States Supreme Court issued two significant rulings. And both of these rulings should be carefully considered by employers, including revisiting some policies that perhaps we can talk about in a, in a few minutes. But, but I, let me just begin briefly with the first case. Mm -hmm. And this is the uh, Students for Fair Admissions case. And it dealt with affirmative action. Yes. Now, this was a school case, admissions for college, college students right. college. with yes. uh, both public and private universities. And essentially, the Supreme Court held that these institutions can no longer place an emphasis on race as a plus type factor. And educational institutions historically had leeway in this area. And you could make the argument that they took it too far, and other people might argue they didn't take it far enough. But the bottom line was that those sorts of considerations would, um, at least in theory, always typically run afoul of the 14th Amendment, which is uh, equal protection for all citizens, and also federal statutes. If a private institution takes government money, then they're typically bound to the federal statutes. And so they had obligations along these lines, too. And... From an, from an employment perspective, you might ask the question, well, what does this matter to employment law? Well, yes. you know, most of the clients we work with have diversity, equity, and inclusion policies. So there's a big question as to whether those policies can go too far as well. And uh, so I, in, in general, employers need to be mindful of the fact that this Supreme Court is clear, affirmative action uh, at least in the context of placing special emphasis or credit to race or any other protected characteristic, is unacceptable. Okay. And that same rule would apply to employers. And I understand there's another case out there that's dealing with the USPS, but I, I'm really kind of fuzzy on that one. Can you share a little well, bit about that one right now? Now, now, really, that's bigger than the affirmative action case because it's going to affect a lot of employers day to day. Okay. And th this case uh, involved the United States Postal Service and the issue of whether one of their employees could observe the Sabbath every week and not work. Okay. And so that this has been an age-old challenge in employment situations where you've got someone who has a sincerely held religious belief, they don't want to work the Sabbath, but if, if, if the employer is always operating on the Sabbath, then that means everyone else gives up their Saturday or Sunday to cover for this person. Right. Or they're thrown into overtime, which is an additional cost, of course. When I say they, I mean the person who's covering, covering sure. is thrown into overtime, which increases costs. And, you know, it can fracture work teams. And Why is this guy getting special treatment when I'm not? It, sure, ex certainly. Exactly. Right. And, you know, our weekends are precious to us, right? <laughs> of course. And so I understand the, the, the nature of the conflict and why, why it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. it's the historical rule was that if the request for accommodation, and it could be Sabbath off, it, it could be something like, I want to go to a religious conference and I need the, I need the week off in two weeks, mm -hmm. or I want to go on a mission trip. Sure. It could be all sorts of different requests. Okay. But the historical rule was, if the request requires the employer 
to incur more than a de minimis or a minimal disruption, then it doesn't have to be granted. And, and what it meant was, yeah, you should sit down and talk with the person and say, okay, can we accommodate without any cost? Mm -hmm. In other words, maybe somebody's willing to work Sunday, and maybe they're perfectly fine working Sunday, so we can just switch up shifts. Okay. And that often worked pretty well. But <laughs> the Supreme Court, and, and it's I, I find it a very quick, interesting aside, people try to take a Supreme Court and they put it into categories, like conservative or liberal. Oh, sure. or sometimes we're not even sure what those terms really mean mm -hmm. in the context of a court. This court does things that are against business interests, uh, big business interests and small business interests. And the court seems not to be guided by politics. Mm. They're guided by statutory construction. They read the statute, they do their best to find out or determine what it means, and they apply the statute. Black and white. That's what they do, black and white. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate that and on some level, but this case creates real problems for our clients because <laughs> it, it blew up the old rule. And, and they, so they said, okay, it's not de minimis. Uh, there's the new standard and it's undue burden and it's defined in part as a substantial increased cost in the nature and context of the employer's business. <laughs> Yeah, well, the problem is I could define de minimis. Mm -hmm. I can't define this new term. Sure. And my job is to counsel employers as to how to comply with the law. Mm -hmm. That's going to be made substantially more difficult now because of this new standard that was issued with not a whole lot of explanation. Interestingly, what the court did was they said, here's the new standard. And they sent it back to the court, the lower court, to figure out what it all meant and to apply it. So we're looking at, you know, five, 10 years of trying to figure out what this new thing means. And uncertainty is not something that our clients appreciate. And I, I can tell you, they don't appreciate lawyers who rest their opinions on, well, everything's uncertain and they qualify everything. And sometimes you just have to do that. So we're looking at a brand new era for religious accommodation in the workplace. And the big question is this, Will the new standard be closer to the de minimis standard? You know, it could be just a little more than de minimis. Okay. Or is it the Americans with Disabilities Act standard, mm -hmm. which is very, very, very difficult for an employer to meet? And the EEOC is going to be issuing new regulations. Will they just apply the ADA undue uh, hardship standard in the religious context? And if they do then, boy, we're going to be seeing a lot more religious requests. <laughs> and, and do you see, like, like, as this kind of rolls out, if I clearly apply for a job that requires that I work weekends, but I know my religious belief says I cannot work on a Saturday or Sunday, do you see it being a barrier even to individuals applying for positions or to employees that say, yeah, I can do this, and then they come in and expect an accommodation? I know. The, the individual has the right to seek the job and secure the job and request an accommodation. Sure. Yeah. Sounds like a busy time ahead for many HR professionals, right? Right. And, and so what we'll have to do is we'll have to work collaboratively, unfortunately, on a case-by-case -case basis with clients to determine matters such as risk tolerance, exposure you know if if we get this wrong what are the costs mm. are you willing to incur those costs is this a hill you're willing to die on or do we have yet another category where we're going to have to bend over backwards a lot of times um, it, we're getting more and more of these categories sure we've got pregnancy accommodations <laughs> that are relatively new we now have this new religious accommodation we have ADA accommodations, and the, the old idea was treat everybody the same. I don't think that's the new idea. Yeah, it's becoming pretty individualistic, I think, I, yes. you know, from what and, I'm hearing. And so. very fact-intensive, and, and again, our businesses, while they're committed to equal employment opportunity, they really need certainty with respect to 
how they can run their business. And our area is becoming, unfortunately, less and less certain. Yeah. yeah. So let's go back to, you know, I'm an employer. I'm a member of the Chamber of Commerce. What should I be doing now in response to the Supreme Court, in response of things that are on the horizon? What's the action that needs to be taken? Well, as to these two cases, there are some specific actions. And on the uh, Students for Fair Admission case, the Affirmative Action case, I, I believe it's important to go back and review your diversity, equity, and inclusion programs to try to make sure that everybody understands that there can't be any reverse discrimination. Right. It's right. simply not acceptable. And this case is going to encourage more plaintiff's lawyers to pursue the reverse discrimination claims in the employment context. And these claims, these reverse discrimination claims, it's not a theory. It's not theoretically possible. Trust me, it's happened. Uh, we're defending several reverse discrimination cases right now. The, back in the day, if a Caucasian person filed a racial suit, you know, there would be Snickers. It's very, yeah. It's very real today. Yeah. So the, the question is how far can you go or how far should you go with these programs? We all know they add value. Yes. But when do they cross the line? And, and I think it's important to go back and revisit that in light of this case. Okay. So that's the those are the uh, that's another action point loosely associated with that affirmative action case is my goodness, employment litigation is on the rise. Please implement a, a, a arbitration policies okay. and programs so that these cases don't go to a members of a jury that don't understand business or our business. Instead, wouldn't it be better to have the case decided by a, an experienced arbitrator who understands employment law? Yes. At least in most instances, that's where you want the decision to be made. Of course. And in light of the increased litigation and more to come, that's a good step. Okay, perfect. As to the second decision, yes. what do we do about the religious thing? All right, take a look at the handbook. Make sure that the requests for religious accommodation are being specifically cha channeled to someone who knows what they're doing. <laughs> don't, don't have a rule that says, if you want a re uh, religious accommodation, contact your supervisor. Well, I know what a lot of supervisors are going to say. No. I need you here. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, right. Yeah. so we, we've got to take greater care in directing this communication so that it's handled by someone who's experienced and professional. That leads me to a side point of, my goodness, when are we going to start investing more money in our HR functions with laws, with new laws being passed um, and new regulations weekly, certainly monthly? This is becoming complex to the point where it warrants um, in my in my opinion, from many businesses, increased investment in that function. Yeah, it's a it's a multifaceted world HR is these days. It's not just a generalist function. It's not just reviewing resumes. You're you're right. It's policy. It's following the law. It's staying current, building that rapport with this team, and working with supervisors. So can't agree more. Well, so. think think about this. We. Many of us want a, a progressive society where we're recognizing new rights with breakthrough tradition. Certainly, that seems to be the prevailing thought amongst regulators and legislators. Well, if we want that, you know, there's a price to pay. And the price is you're going to be a little less efficient. Things are going to be a little more complex, and it requires more attention to detail. But it's the That's cost of business, are. right? The cost it, of business. It, well, it is. It is. <laughs> at, it is that. Whether you agree or disagree with any of it, it is that. And now you can operate without paying attention to any of this. And if I could get off, I suppose if my clients paid no attention to any of it, I would be a millionaire thirty times <laughs> over in sure. litigation. Yeah. But that's not how it works. We have to be responsible and attempt to comply. Great. I appreciate you coming in. We are going to do an employment law um, event in September. More details to come on that. Thank you so much, Rob, for coming in. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Nancy.
Hi, I'm Shannon Schumacher, Account Executive, Kentucky Market Leader. At Haran, we champion bold innovation to help employers and individuals thrive. As an industry thought leader, we explore new horizons in healthcare, benefits, employee engagement, and wellness. We work harder to deliver all the strategic benefits, planning, and execution you expect from a true partner. And we do it with laser focus on your short and long-term outcomes to help manage your benefits while improving your employee experience. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you so much for tuning into the podcast and learning a little bit more about the Louisville Orchestra and what's going on with the Supreme Court's recent decisions with our friends at Frost Brown Todd. Thank you to our podcast sponsors, CVG, C Crew Consulting, and Haran. Don't forget to check out nkychamber.com slash events to stay up to date on all of the Chamber's awesome events. We have a jam-packed list of events happening this summer. Finally, if you're a member who would like to be featured on the podcast, or if you're someone who is interested in becoming a member of the Northern Kentucky Chamber of Commerce, please reach out to Lynn Ablin. And if you're someone who is interested in sharing your workforce strategies and resources on NKY at Work, please reach out to Nancy Spivey. You can find their contact information on the screen in front of you or at nkychamber.com at our staff directory. Thanks again for tuning in. I'll talk to you all next week.